Lotte Downey at Promega. Ik werk in de genetische identiteit uh, business unit at Promega en ik ben hier met dokter Peter de Knijf. Aangenaam. Welkom. But I know not a lot of people will understand Dutch, so we're going to continue in English. Peter, you head up the forensic uh, DNA research lab at the University of Leiden. Can you tell me a little bit about your job? Yes, I started um, that particular laboratory 25 years ago <coughs> because at that time the Dutch politicians issued a new law which, mm -hmm. gave, which gave suspects who were forced to donate um, a blood sample for forensic DNA research were given the independent right for a contra expertise. Mm -hmm. So there was a need for a contra expertise laboratory in Holland. So the Ministry of Justice shopped around all the universities. Leiden University agreed to house the contra expertise mm -hmm. laboratory and they asked me if I would like to become head of that particular laboratory. Uh, so I thought about a month or so and then I agreed. Good. So what attracts you to forensics? Uh, in the beginning it was, was not as much forensics but population genetics mm -hmm. uh, because I knew that doing forensic research <coughs> also meant that you had to invest in population genetics mm -hmm. in order to interpret the data and um, I very much like all the statistics involved with population genetics um, but in the end also I like uh, technolo technological developments mm -hmm. and if there is any field of science which uh, technology played a major role it is DNA research right. in, in general sense and my lab is part of a very big uh, technology-driven human genetic department. It was already 25 years ago and it is still is. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm just exactly where I want to be. Good. So you're talking about your love for technology and technology-driven. Would you agree with me that you're being seen as the guru of um, next-gen sequencing in forensics? Um, well, I'm certainly one of the first people speaking about that uh, mm -hmm. already a long time ago, um, predicting that in the end it would become a major field. Uh, but as with all new technologies, especially in forensics, mm -hmm. many will fail to, to deliver. Right. So you never know in advance if you start a new technology whether or not it will be successful. Mm -hmm. um, but stubborn as I am, uh, I think that I can also now conclude <laughs> that it is successful. So we have an end product, uh, we can do massive parallel sequencing in forensic casework very successfully. Mm -hmm. So it took 10 years, but we we do it now. So yeah. Good. I would call you the guru of Thank you. massively parallel sequencing in forensics. Um, so, like you say, you've been a pioneer in it. You were the first one to present a, court, uh, a case yeah. that used massively parallel sequencing in court. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit on how you got the court to accept this new technology? In Holland, that's not a big problem uh, because we can only use technologies which are ISO 1725 accredited. Right. And when the court reads that this technology is accredited in Holland. Mm -hmm. They know that it has uh, underwent rigid t testing um, and quality assurance testing. So they know that it is reliable and reproducible. Um, nevertheless, they also need to be able to understand mm -hmm. exactly what you're doing. And the major advantage of applying massive parallel sequencing to STRs is that the court system is used to work with STR variation mm -hmm. and we just identify the STR variation in a different way so it is very close to their comfort zone okay. and that was the reason why I deliberately choose to stay using STRs as the first example of massively parallel sequencing mm -hmm. because it's close to what judges think they understand okay. uh, and that helped tremendously so it wasn't challenged no also not by the defense Really? That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Good. So where do you, um, 
what role do you think and what impact do you think massively parallel sequencing will have on forensics in the next five years? Um, we will see a gradually change of laboratories using massive parallel sequencing in not as a routine technology, but in those stains where capillary simply fails to deliver mm -hmm. a message, where there is still enough DNA to be interrogated, mm -hmm. uh, and where massive parallel sequencing can help you out. Um, but I see the way we use massive parallel sequencing right now as an intermediate phase between capillary and just going for whole genome sequencing. Okay. Uh, because I think that, that's in the end, is that's where we were going. Uh, but it is too far-fetched mm -hmm. for most people right now. In forensics, not in clinical diagnostics, but in forensics it is. How long do you think it will take before it gets there in forensics? Ten years at least. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I just want to switch gears a little bit. Um, what would you consider, uh, from a professional standpoint, your biggest accomplishment? Well, three things. Uh, first, uh, getting YSTRs successfully introduced to forensics, mm -hmm. which is what I did in the late 90s, together with Manfred Kaiser and Lutz Rower. Mm -hmm. And now it is a routine tool, right. uh, but we were the first. Uh, then later, uh, developing a DNA isolation method, which allows me to get DNA profiles out of cartridges, mm -hmm. which were at that time considered to be impossible to get DNA profiles from. Mm -hmm. um, well, we can. Uh, we introduced the technology and finally now it is seen that that is delivering also in the United States. Uh, labs took over the technology which I developed. And I think massive parallel sequencing I think is still the nicest thing. Yeah. Because that's something where I was involved in not only in the lab work, but also with all the IT aspects. Mm -hmm. So writing scripts, writing software by others, uh, also be able to demonstrate, even in court if it is necessary, what you're actually doing. Mm -hmm. And then even be able to show every single read you get out of an experiment. Uh, that is something which um, we thought about very carefully uh, when we started with everything, and we now have the full product. Uh, and it's being used now, at least in Holland, and it will be used slowly and gradually in other countries. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it will have, in the end, a major impact. Okay, good. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're presenting at the meeting this week? Uh, very simple. I will explain very basically what massive parallel sequencing of short tendon repeats is. Mm -hmm. Most people will probably already know it basically, and I will present three completely different case examples where I will show the additional value of using MPS in cases where capillary couldn't deliver the essential message. Mm -hmm. Meaning you could either exclude a suspect or include a suspect, okay. or made a choice between two equally likely suspects. So mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that's exactly what you can do with SP, with MBS. Right. So that's what I will show. Good. I'm going to have one surprise question, and I I'm stealing this question um, from my colleague, <laughs> who interviewed Walter Parsons, and she asked Walter, and I'm going to ask you. You're in a tree. You have a gun and one bullet, and you see I think it was a lion, a pair of leopards. And I'm just making this up, a tiger. Who are you going to shoot first? The lion. Can you say why? As a predator, I think that the lion is the most unpredictable. Uh, I can understand, I understand cats. Yeah. Uh, but lions have the capability of hiding their emotions, whereas leopards and tigers can't. So I would feel more safe among a leopard or tigers than among a lion. Okay, that's a great answer. Well, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs>